Welcome to the NPTEL course on uh, basic ornithology. Um, I'm Suhail, and um, we have uh, the other instructor for the week, uh, Dr. Jaipal, also over here. Uh, perhaps somebody can just do a thumbs up for me if you can hear me. Always worried about Zoom and whether it's working or not. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great. That means that people are actually listening. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and we have uh, uh, today uh, the instructors for the first uh, week, that's myself and Dr. Jaipal, as well as we have uh, uh, Devika, uh, who is the course coordinator. And then we have a number of uh, teaching assistants, Jobin and uh, Sonia and Chiti. I think they're all online today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what uh, we do in these live sessions in a bit. But to first, just to introduce the course, um, uh, because it's the first kind of live session we're, ha we're having, and in the introduction to ornithology, we didn't actually introduce the, the, the course itself. Um, and so, as you know, this is a uh, massive open online course, a MOOC. Uh, it's uh, free for every, everyone to take. Um, if, uh, uh, but if you want a certificate uh, from NPTEL signed by the uh, different partner institutions who are running this course, then uh, you would need to take an exam for which the, uh, there's a, a thousand rupee fee. That exam uh, is taken only in person. So there are different exam centers across the country. <clears throat> and there are some exam centers in other parts of the world, not just in India. And if you are in a place where you can't, um, you don't have an exam center close by or in a country where there's no exam center, then you can write to NPTEL uh, and there may be another option for you to take a, a written exam. Uh, and uh, participate in the course and get the certification, uh, even if there isn't an exam center close by. So the way in which uh, this uh, course works is that we have um, uh, some pre-recorded material for you every week, uh, starting this week, of course, which you then you would you which you would uh, take a look at and um, and think about, uh, and you can ask questions about it on the discussion forum, which is through your uh, course uh, dashboard. There's a ask a question link and that takes you to a discussion forum where you can ask the question and the instructors from uh, that week uh, uh, you should specify to whom the question is being addressed and the relevant person will reply to you uh, or sometimes the teaching assistants may reply on uh, behalf of, of the instructors um, so do take advantage of that uh, i think uh, not everybody is on that discussion forum but it's very useful even if you don't have to ask a question it's very interesting and useful to look at the other questions people have asked and to you know, look at the responses and to think about the responses because obviously the questions and responses go beyond the uh, material that's on the videos themselves. Uh, so that's about the pre-recorded videos. You are you can view those videos at any time uh, after they are um, made public, made, made available uh, through your dashboard. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and then there's also a weekly assignment or a weekly quiz uh, which uh, typically is a set of multiple choice questions. So they, though they may be every now and then a, a question to which uh, a written answer is required. But typically, there'll be multiple choice questions. Uh, and that's every week for all 12 weeks of this course. Um, and they're there really to uh, help you think about and reflect on the, on the recordings, on the, on the lectures that you've heard. Um, and the scores on those contribute to your final score. Um, and of course, the final exam contributes as well. Uh, in addition to uh, the uh, pre-recorded lectures, we have these live sessions like uh, like today, uh, where you can ask but not questions necessarily only on the discussion uh, forum over there, written uh, type out your questions, but you can come here live and ask your questions or uh, you're sent a form as well in advance to uh, a Google form to uh, send in questions, but we'll have time for live uh, question answer as well during these live sessions. Mm, there is also going to be uh, additional live sessions with uh, uh, two of the teaching assistants, Jobin and uh, Chiti, and that schedule will be given to you if it's not already uh, given to you. Uh, so all this will be happening uh, in that week. This is going to happen every week. So every week there's multiple hours of live sessions to complement the, uh, the pre-recorded videos. In addition, we also have on some of the weeks, uh, not all uh, weeks, but some of the weeks we have uh, guest lectures as well. So guest lectures typically will be about case studies, um, case studies on the topics that uh, we've covered during that week. 
and those are very exciting you must attend those guest lectures uh, because uh, they'll be from um, experts young experts in the field uh, who are currently doing research on the on the topics being covered and uh, so those will be live as well and you can ask questions live uh, during those guest lectures all of the live sessions um, uh, in my understanding is including this one today uh, is uh, of course live streamed but also recorded and available for later viewing again you'll be able to find them on your uh, on your dashboard uh, the recordings may not be available immediately but in a few days uh, they should be available um, you'll notice that the lectures the pre-recorded lectures also have transcripts uh, so you can uh, follow along the text of what is being said um, while you're listening to the to the videos and this uh, hopefully will be helpful to um, to some of you what else to say about the course? Um, the course is uh, is aimed at um, those of you who are either bachelors or masters or maybe early PhD students who um, are interested in potentially taking up ornithology, that is the study of birds, the scientific study of birds as a as a research direction or research career. We do uh, tend to have about half of our participants being not. Uh, students not uh, enrolled in an academic program, program, maybe not with any background in biology uh, at all, or science for that matter, uh, but those who are enthusiasts, those who are um, uh, from whatever pro profession, from homemakers to um, engineers, doctors, or whoever else who want to learn more about birds, um, and uh, but aren't necessarily in, a, in an academic program. And I think... Um, you know, the participants span the entire age range of something like 12 to 80 or 90. Uh, so we have a great diversity of participants. But I do want to just mention one um, one caution or caveat for those who are not uh, here as part of an academic uh, uh, program. Um, the course is aimed at, is about the scientific study of ornithology. So it is academic in nature. Uh, that's also why it is on the NPTEL platform, because um, uh, NPTEL does provide, um, or rather, one can take these uh, the course for credit in one's college or university, typically. And so this is academic credit. So um, it is um, uh, academically focused. And uh, last uh, year, where the first time we ran it, we did get lots of comments and uh, complaints, I would say, that it's too... Um, uh, it's too complex, too in-depth, uh, too much jargon, um, too many scientific terms, and so on. Um, and I'm afraid uh, those of you who are coming from that uh, perspective will have to excuse us, because that is really the focus of the, the study. Everybody's welcome to join, but please, it's important for everybody to understand also the scope and the intent of the, uh, of the course. It is not aimed at amateurs who want to learn a little more about birds. It is aimed at uh, students uh, potentially embarking on a career in biology and potentially in ornithology. Uh, I should also say that uh, faculty also take this course uh, for their uh, uh, for development, faculty development uh, requirements. Mm, so again, uh, an academic focus. Um, maybe um, um, we can take a minute or two since we do have time and I don't think there's many questions that have come in already. We can take a minute or two uh, to... Um, See if there are any questions about the course itself. If you do have questions about the course itself, maybe you could um, uh, type in the chat box. That would be best. <clears throat> uh, and let's see how much engagement we get, and then we'll decide uh, whether to let people unmute and ask. So um, I'm just going to quickly look at the chat box. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, so Daniel, yes. I think it's it's wonderful that uh, you know that people from other countries. I know of um, uh, several people from our neighboring countries around India and South Asia who are taking this course. Really um, nice to know that people from the neotropics, Latin America as well. Um, and there, I think you've got uh, an email address to write to. That's great. Okay, is there a validity for the certificate? Now uh, the certificate is ne so if you do want to take. Uh, Sorry, I'm not quite sure what you mean by validity. Do you mean, um, is there a duration of validity? Does it expire after some time? Or uh, in what way do people recognize a certificate? Um, I don't know about an expiry. Uh, I know that some of the um, exams, international exams you take or, or other exams have an expiry. They're valid for five years or whatever else. Uh, I'm not aware about this 
Mm, but if you are taking for academic credit, then it will be typically in the uh, session or course that you are uh, in right now. So uh, it shouldn't need to be valid for particularly long. Um, uploading of assignments. So assignments uh, will uh, tend to be, uh, so this is an answer to Aparna, explained about uploading of assignments. Mm, the assignments one, number one, will be based on the um, on the lectures, whether they're the pre-recorded lectures or the guest lectures. And the assignments can also come from the guest lectures. Uh, plus, um, whatever additional reading has been uh, given, uh, which you'll see in your dashboard, uh, given by the instructors for that week. Okay, so that's the um, that's the scope. That's what you need to know in order to uh, do the assignments or the the quizzes. Um, and uh, basically, when you click, you'll see there's a, a quiz, a kind of page opens, and then you you can take the quiz. Um, and my understanding is you can take the quiz, uh, you can update the quiz if you like, and take it multiple times until such time as the quiz uh, duration ends, that is the deadline passes, uh, and your most recent answers will be submitted automatically at that point. Mm, because uh, you have many days, I think 10 days to finish the assignments, they're, they're not uh, closed book, they're open book assignments, you can read the questions, you can go back to the study material, whether it's the uh, recordings or the videos, the lectures, all the uh, reading assignments, and you are welcome to look at those and um, and update your answers or answer in the first place in the quiz. Okay, so the quizzes are really open. Um, it's not meant for you uh, to, to test your memory in a span of ten minutes or something like that. So, um, um, Anshul says I haven't finished my week one videos uh, yet. That's fine. As long as you can, uh, you, the videos will be available all through. So week one videos will be available all through uh, till week 12 and later till the final exam. Uh, the actual deadlines, the weekly deadlines for you are the assignment deadlines. Okay, so keep track of that. Uh, the videos you can watch at any time, but of course you need to watch the videos to finish to do the assignments. Uh, uh, Girish says, uh, how is the assignment taken? Um, can you do it in multiple sessions? My uh, understanding, my recollection from last time is you can do it in multiple se uh, sessions. You can you submit it once or save it once and you can come back and update it. Maybe if one of the teaching assistants can just confirm that for me, if you know this right now, or else we will uh, get back on the discussion forum. We'll get back to you and, and tell you. Mm -hmm. So Girish, your question is, is pending. We'll uh, figure that out. Um, do we have any field assignment? Karthik asked, we don't have a field assignment. We uh, decided it's... Uh, we, we did have the ambition and we discussed it a bit in the first, um, we well, preparing for the first edition last year. But uh, you'll see from your dashboard, there are about three and a half thousand people who have registered for the course, although not everybody will actually be participating. But even if it's a thousand or 500, uh, it's a bit much uh, to plan field uh, assignments. So we don't have, for this particular course, we don't have field assignments. Hopefully there'll be more advanced courses later um, where there are field sessions as well. How many lectures are uploaded in a week? Astha says that variable. Um, it can be as little as uh, three, two or three uh, lectures, but then uh, it can be many more, especially if we have guest lectures and so on. So the total viewing time for you in every week, I think, will be um, um, between two hours, uh, including guest lectures and other things, two hours, and uh, it could be up to four to five hours, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the number of lectures into which that viewing time is broken, that also is variable. Uh, you didn't submit last week assignment. Last week's assignment was week zero. Week zero assignments, as my understanding, if I remember correctly, are optional. So if you didn't submit last week week zero assignments, then there's no impact. Um, there's also, uh, and I can't remember exactly um, what out of the 12 assignments you have, I think NPTEL takes the uh, top 10 uh, assignments for your top eight. score. Top eight. Top eight. Yeah. top eight, that's amazing. So you can bunk a lot. <laughs> Uh, eight out of 12 assignments is the minimum that you have to complete. Uh, so uh, if you don't complete some or if you do very badly on some, don't worry. Uh, you will still have your top eight that you can rely on for uh, for the final mark and certificate. Yeah. Um, should I log in NPTEL separately or log in on I SYM is enough? Uh, Khalil, I'm not quite sure. I think that um, as long as you have registered for this course and typically you'll do that through the SWAYAM interface to NPTEL, then um, you are fine. And uh, maybe one of the teaching assistants can put in the uh, link to the course uh, dashboard. And as long as they're using that course, course dashboard, you're perfectly fine. Uh, and Khalil, uh, given that you know about the session, you would have got an email 
about it. That means you're in the system, you're, you're all fine. Hmm? Don't worry about it. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I'll try to scroll here. Ananya, is Ananya next? That is my, yeah. Uh, after completion, do learners have the opportunity to get um, to work with others uh, as an internship? Uh, so that may be possible. NPTEL does offer internships. Uh, those are paid internships, but there may be internship opportunities outside NPTEL as well. So I would say, um, yeah, there are opportunities and there are, of course, opportunities even without doing this course. Right? Uh, but maybe having done this course, you'll have a better idea of what it is that you might be getting into, who are the people working, what are the kinds of uh, topics that are interesting to work on. So yes, you will have the opportunity uh, and either somebody will contact you. Uh, typically, some of the, the top scorers on the exam may get uh, directly contacted by some of the faculty or others uh, offering them internship. Uh, but if that doesn't happen to you, there's nothing to stop you from writing to people uh, and asking uh, for internships or other opportunities. And maybe uh, Devika or somebody could just post the uh, link to the um, the directory of ornithologists that uh, is exists uh, where you can search for opportunities um, for internships or volunteering or any other kind of position in ornithology. So there's a directory that's been put together, which is a useful tool. Uh, Amit says, I'm not a research aspirant. Um, should you take this course? Uh, Amit, it depends on how deep your interest is. If you are just starting out, uh, for example, on bird watching and bird photography, then maybe this course is not enough. Uh, uh, sorry, not quite suitable for you. Those who have been in bird watching as amateurs and enthusiasts for a long time and who really want to get um, you know, much more deeply into understanding uh, birds and the science of birds, uh, then that then the course is for you. I think having watched the first week's lectures, if you watched, um, uh, especially Dr. Jayapal's lectures, you'll get an idea about whether this is of interest to you, because that's the kind of depth into which uh, we would be going in this course. So perhaps some of the first week lectures would be a way for you to decide. You are free to drop out at any time. You can come back a year or two years later and take the course again. It's a very open platform. Uh, it's a really wonderful platform that NPTEL has put together for all of us to take advantage of. Um, more details about the final exam, Raya, I think you are jumping the gun a little bit. It's far away from now. Um, it it will have a, a number of questions. Again, mostly, uh, uh, well, it may may all be multiple choice questions, may have one or two written questions. And, and the final exam was just a, an encapsulation of the entire course. So you think of the individual week assignments, you put them together, and that's the content for the uh, final exam. So it isn't very, very complicated. Which book is best used for ornithologists? Uh, depends on whether you are uh, interested in ornithological science. Uh, there's the handbook for bird biology. There's, I think, uh, several books called Ornithology themselves. Um, and I think that uh, Dr. Jaipal might have put some uh, uh, additional reference material in um, the, the reading for his lectures. I'm not quite sure, but we can also uh, type out some, uh, some textbooks uh, for you. Um, and if you are not uh, talking about the, the textbook type book, but more of a bird field guide or something like that, then there's, of course, an entirely different set of books, um, which, again, I think we'll get to in the course at some point. Uh, Jovin clarified, you may submit it any time before the due date. Yeah. But just be careful about when the due date is. Um, uh, where to submit these assignments? Um, if somebody can just post a link to the, uh, the dashboard, uh, please. Um, on the left side, uh, Satvika, on the left side, you have a, a panel which lists the different weeks. And if you click on, for example, week one, it expands the menu down and it uh, gives you links to the lectures and then also the assignments uh, and also to recordings of these live sessions and the guest lectures and so on. Is it mandatory uh, to take assignments? Uh, no, it is not mandatory. Interestingly enough, you can simply... You can engage with this course as you wish, whatever suits you. If you're not interested in the assignments, the exams, that's fine. If you just want to watch the videos and follow along, we'll be in the live sessions, listen to the guest lectures and just uh, sit back, relax and enjoy. That's also fine. Uh, we welcome it. You don't have to take the exams, as I say, especially if you're not in the academic study. Uh, whatever you get out of it, in whatever way, you're welcome to, uh, to engage. So thanks for that question. Uh, Mm. Is it good enough to watch videos? Uh, Girish, is this in reference to the final exam? I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, largely, the questions for the assignments and the exam, final exam will come for, from the uh, lectures, the pre-recorded lectures, as well as the guest lectures. 
um, if if especially if there's a lot of additional reading material, we don't really. It's it's actually meant to be supplementary. Huh? We don't really expect you have you have gone through and studied all the all the reading material, uh, additional reading material given. So so don't stress about that. You know you can focus just on the lectures. But if you find yourself uh, intrigued about something, then please do uh, look at the supplementary, the additional reading material. There's a rich world of of information and ideas out there, of course. Um, both the sessions compulsory for the exam. So this is the final exam. I think Aditi, you're talking about. Now, the final exam has a morning and evening session. You choose one of them. Uh, so basically, there are two uh, sessions in which you can take because people often have to travel to the exam center. So there are two. Uh, the exam is given twice with different questions, and so you choose one or the other. You don't sit the exam twice. Uh, last edition exam question available. Somebody is very guest one two three is very serious person. No, I don't think the last exam questions are available. I'm I'm afraid not. We don't have uh, those. Uh, Rahul is a professor of zoology. Yes. Mm. How much of the course is relevant from the research point of view? So I think uh, Rahul that it is very relevant. We uh, all um, uh, of the faculty have put together the uh, le their lectures very much from a research uh, point of view. Um, or, or, you know, some of the lectures are divided into different topics in ornithology, like th this week's has been about evolution and taxonomy and, and, and so on, systematics, and then we have anatomy, physiology, and then we'll have behavior and various aspects of ecology and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also a set of lectures about uh, the process of doing research. How do you come up with questions, research questions? How do you design your study? Um, how do you uh, collect and analyze your data? So, um, the the focus is really for those people who want to uh, learn about birds in order to do research uh, in the future. So Rahul, I hope that helps. It is actually uh, for, um, you say you want to learn to be able to plan experiments or studies pertaining to birds. Hopefully this will be he helpful. We've done it from that point of view. What is the scope for ornithology? Oh gosh, there are lots of questions here. We'll have to stop at 5.30 and then I'll, I'll pass on to uh, Dr. Jaipal to answer the questions that have come in for him. Uh, the topic uh, specific questions, lecture questions. Scope for ornithology in India um, is um, not huge, but it is uh, it's not bad and it's growing. Uh, when uh, Dr. Jaipal and I were uh, master's students, I think the scope was very narrow. Uh, it was pretty much only in research, um, but now it's much more. So research is one scope, research whether it's in, in uh, the mainstream academic uh, institutions like universities and so on, uh, and teaching of course there, but uh, also in uh, uh, civil society organizations, non-profit organizations that also carry out research. There are a number of those. Uh, then there is scope in, um, <clears throat> in, for example, conservation on the ground. Uh, a lot more conservation happening on the ground. A lot of uh, opportunities and jobs as well uh, related to that. Uh, there are many more with the ideas about sustainable uh, sustainability and so on. Uh, in industry as well, there are more and more positions uh, for uh, people who work uh, in companies trying to help those companies uh, become more sustainable in various ways. And so birds, are of course, not the only part. The birds are one part of it, but I think what you learn here will be able, will help over there. Mm, uh, there are uh, startups that provide consultancies to these companies as well. So you might could be employed directly by a big, big company, or you could work for a, a smaller company that provides these consultancy services, for example, assessing the biodiversity of a company campus and, and things like that. And then, of course, there are the, the government um, um, uh, sort of jobs, the forest department and the Indian Forest Service and so on. So there, I can't give you a comprehensive thing right now. And uh, maybe we should ask ornithology.in to put together something uh, about the scope. Um, uh, maybe if you guys can stop asking questions, <laughs> we can, uh, so I can struggle. I was just struggling to get to. Can we get previous question papers? I think not. Sorry about that. Uh, the link to dashboard is taking us to the Zoom dialog box. So somebody will have to solve that problem. I can't do it right now. Um, can we have some question papers where you can understand standard of the exam? Uh, just look at the weekly assignments and you'll get an idea about the standard of the exam. Okay, It's not going to be very different. Uh, final exam is optional. If you want a certificate, you have to do the final exam. If you don't need a certificate and if you're just really uh, doing it for your own uh, satisfaction in this course, then you don't really need a certificate and then you don't have to attend the final exam, nor do you have to do any of the assignments and so on for that matter. Uh, for how long will the video, the videos uh, will be available all through the course until a few weeks, I think, after the final exam. Um, the, sorry, the videos actually will be available um, uh, like, you know, indefinitely, I think, 
um, they're on YouTube and they don't get taken down from YouTube is my understanding. So you can watch the videos of the lectures far beyond uh, as well. Uh, do you get any PDF or material? You will get a PDF uh, transcript of the lectures, um, but uh, we don't give you addition, ad additional material apart from the additional reading that will be there on the dashboard. Final exam is subjective, objective, mostly objective, that is um, multiple choice, but they may, we leave open the option that there may be some subjective or written uh, exam uh, questions. Mm. Okay. Is biology important as a prerequisite for the course? Uh, it's not important. There's no prerequisites for this course, as you know, because every, anybody and everybody can sign up, uh, including uh, children who've not finished school. Um, but biology is helpful to understand some of the uh, some of the terms and concepts. Uh, but of course, um, uh, you know you can learn those up yourself. That's that's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, uh, bird banding, Aisha. Um, uh, I you will maybe there'll be some examples in the course about how people use bird ringing or banding uh, for research. But of course, we don't have any in person sessions. You can't learn bird ringing without doing it in person. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, uh, you'll get an idea of some of the theory maybe, but not uh, practical. Uh, you could uh, look at the directory of ornithologists. Devika's put the link, I think, uh, to see who works in bird ringing and then contact them separately to see if you can uh, intern with them or volunteer with them. What's the criteria of calling my final exam? Uh, I don't think so. You have to get some 60% or something in eight of those uh, weekly assignments put together. Uh, but I'm not sure what other criteria, okay. Um, any specific book for exams? No, exams are based on the uh, lectures uh, in the course, not based on any book. Uh, if it's net GRF mandatory for birds, have you work in the field? No, uh, not at all. Um, as long as you're, you're enthusiastic about uh, birds and you have some experience, you've learned maybe this course, you've maybe done some volunteering, interning or uh, work briefly with others, you know, you've built up a bit of a portfolio in uh, work on birds, uh, then you can work in the field and people will uh, take you on board. Uh, net uh, qualification isn't mandatory, uh, but of course it helps since uh, um, I think net comes with a fellowship. So it always helps for those uh, for people to get a get a position. We post a direct link. But in the final exam, you need to attend all the lectures. Uh, no, I mean, nobody knows how many lectures you've attended because the lectures are pre-recorded and nobody knows. Uh, they only know what you scored in your assignments. So uh, don't stress too much about it. Okay, uh, we are at the end of uh, half an hour. This was just an overview of the course. I'm just trying to, I will look for a minute and see if there are any questions for me. Um, Oh, somebody says in the personal survey, I did not mention. Sorry, I'm looking at the questions that have come in separately. Uh, I did not mention I won't take the exam in April. It's, yeah, it's still okay. It's perfectly fine. To take the exam, you just have to register uh, before the deadline. Now, registration for the exam, I think, is already opened, and the deadline is quite a bit into the future. So it doesn't matter what you said on that form. You just have to register. Um, you have a strong interest. This is now, that was Nigin Babu. The Sayan Ghosh says, uh, a strong interest. Can't figure out research topics within ornithology. So this is exactly what the course is for, Sayan. Please uh, uh, look at the lectures. You'll, you'll be able to see the research topics, the different kinds of things people are working on uh, and hopefully find a specific area of interest. Uh, will you be able to, this is Shambhavi asked, will, will I be able to identify birds in their calls after completion of this course? No, this is not a bird identification course, I'm afraid. This is about the scientific study of birds. Identification is a separate issue, which you'll have to engage with separately. Study material for the course I've covered. Um, and I think some of all the other questions, can we get recordings of the live classes? Anjali asks, and yes, indeed, all the live classes will be recorded and available to you. Uh, yes, Karnika says, I'm enjoying being a course on dinosaur biology. This is dinosaur biology. Uh, absolutely. And uh, tell everybody you know that uh, we have dinosaurs all around us and that's a wonderful uh, thing. Mm. Yeah, somebody sent a direct message, Dhana Lakshmi says, can I take exam in either of one session? I'm not sure what that means. Yes, there are two sections, the final session, the final exam, you take one or the other. Uh, subject or objective, I've already um, covered. Okay, great. I'll um, hand over, I should have introduced myself. I'm Suhail, I work with the Nature Conservation uh, Foundation and uh, uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Jaipal who uh, works at the Salimali Center for Ornithology and Natural History 
um, in Coimbatore. And uh, Jaipal, I think there are a number of questions on the Google uh, sheet. But if there are other questions about uh, Dr. Jaipal's uh, lectures, you can uh, others can um, you know are free to type their questions in the chat box right now, and he'll take them uh, as in, as they come in. Over to you, Jaipal. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Sue. Yeah, I'm I'm Raja Jaipa. I work with Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and Natural History, and uh, I, along with Suhail, one of the two instructors for the first week of this program. So, are there any questions, or should I just go back to the text and link to these things? I think you could take those uh, the ones in the spreadsheet, Jaipal, and then yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, why Lakshadweep doesn't have any endemics? Okay. So uh, I had actually posted uh, two questions for your thought uh, at the end of my, you know, the presentation. One is that uh, despite India having over 1,300, you know, 1,300 species of birds, and we have only 78 species are actually, strictly speaking, politically, you know, speaking, endemic to India. So that turns out to be like, I think, five point something, five percentage. Of, and it's quite low compared to countries, you know, very countries with exceptional diversity like Indonesia or South American countries. So I had asked why is it the endemism in AV fauna, Indian AV fauna is so low. And uh, this is despite the fact that if you look at the endemism in amphibian reptiles and fishes, freshwater fishes, or even, you know, uh, freshwater crabs, it's extremely, you know, uh, they're quite uh, spectacular, but for birds, it's very low. I asked that question, why? Second question is that why, when Andaman and Nicobar have, can have 29 species of birds which are endemic to Andaman and Nicobar, why is, why is not so in Lakshadweep Islands, which are as isolated as you know Andaman Islands, but we didn't have a single species endemic to that. And a couple of, I think, participants also posted in the uh, discussion forum. And uh, <coughs> so I think, you know, the answers are like, you know, almost it's, it's right. So let me tell the uh, briefly tell I'll post a detailed answer on the discussion forum by this evening. So uh, Sugil, do they have access to the last year discussion forum question answer things? No. No, I don't think so, Jaipal. Okay. So no issues. So I'll post that uh, detailed answer this evening. So uh, let me be very brief. Uh, why are there not very few endemics among Indian AV fauna? The reason is that, uh, as I, you know, as you have watched in that evolution, avian evolution presentation, so Indian plate diversified, you know, it's got separated from the Gondwana plate almost 120 to 100, you know, 120 million years ago. So the next 100 million years ago, the conventional view, we thought that the Indian plate was, you know, isolated right from the, you know, it's a dissociation from the African plate and it's dissociation from next, very quickly next, after that is the Madagascar plate. So Madagascar and India, then they, you know, they separated 100 year, million years back. And slowly the Indian plate started moving separately towards Northeast and hit the Asian plate. And this, uh, when it hit the Asian plate, it was about 60 million years ago. And uh, so that's when the, you know, the, you know, when it hit the Asian plate, the uprising of the Himalayas started. So now around this time, there is something else, you know, a major geological event also happened in the Indian subcontinents. That's the, you know, a huge volcanic eruption that is centered in the, you know, the central India. That's we call it as a Deccan traps. So this Deccan trap volcanic activity was, in fact, if you, you look at the historically, if you look at the top 10, you know, the major, volcanic activity, one will be the Decontra event. So the, the effect is enormous, so enormous that, you know, it, you know, you can still see, you can actually see, you know, parts of Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. So it's the plateau, Deccan plateau. So the Deccan plateau is actually the, you know, the outcome of this uh, volcanic eruption. Basically, it's the deposit of the volcanic, you know, uh, the emissions, the ashes and other these things. So that you know, for almost, uh, they say that almost for one to two million years, this, the you know, the entire uh, atmosphere was filled with a very dark suit. And uh, so the Deccan trap event, uh, you know, that killed quite a substantial portion of the life organisms and mainly in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, so, 
that was the one uh, you know the conventional view that why why are they, so whatever that birds that we now see you know they actually you know migrated or they colonized after the Deccan trap event and then they diversified because of the niche diversification you know we got some endemics and others. so <clears throat> so this is actually one view but uh, recently there are also two uh, alternate views one is that Ashok Sani, so he proposed in 1980s, uh, late 1980s, he proposed that uh, Indian plate, when it was moving away from the African until it hit the Asian plate, it was not as isolated as we thought. Like, you know, we conventional thought was at 100 million years, uh, for 100 million years period, Indian plate was isolated, but it was apparently not to be so. And it was always connected with the Mascarene Plateau, currently holding you no know, Seychelles, Mauritius Island. And also, you know, the locative ridge, so the Lakshadweep ridge. So it was always connected to the mainland Africa by these ridges and plateaus. So the birds could easily move in and out. So that means that, you know, uh, the, since the birds could easily move in and out, so there was very little likelihood for endemic species to evolve. That was the Ashok Sani's, you know, proposal. And uh, then 90s, John Briggs from Oxford University, he's a geologist. So John Briggs says that, you know, he put forward another hypothesis. And, uh, you know, he, he said that uh, the Indian plate, you know, even though it was connected to the masculine plateau, the, these things, it was even well connected. He says that, you know, it was Indian plate moved very close to the African things till this uh, you know, the northeastern Africa, then it started moving towards the west instead of taking a diamet diametrically, you know, northeastern direction. So he actually studied the marine fishes of the eastern Indian, the eastern part of the Indian Ocean and western part of the Indian Ocean, and he did uh, extensive molecular phylogeny. And he found that the fishes, the marine fishes in the eastern part and the western part are actually less than 3 million years old. So that means that whatever the endemism that, you know, the, in the marine fishes or whatever the local uh, congregation, local species compose, local species assembly ages in the marine fishes in the Indian oceans are actually less than three, year, three million years old. So he proposed saying that this could have, you know, this could have been possible only when the Indian plate was extremely close to Africa, moved extremely close to Africa, then started moving to the west along the Asian plate. So now that these are the three major hypotheses why there are very few endemic species of you know birds in India. Of course, you get speculative and uh, more and more phylogeny works are required to actually you know pinpoint the exact cause. And uh, so that that's the first question. The second question is that uh, why are the lecture deep things? I think I think most of you got your answer absolutely right. Yes, lecture deep islands are actually of coral origin, no? unlike the Andaman and Nicobar. Andaman and Nicobar, actually Andaman and Nicobar islands are, uh, you know, they are actually the mountain peaks. So they are, they are mountain peaks jutting above the water level, the oceanic level. So this, it's actually a continuation of this Arakan range, Arakan range from the Myanmar, Indo-Myanmar border, and it comes down south and that almost meets the Sumatra. So there is a, a long mountain chain right from Myanmar to Sumatra. And so this mountain chain have high peaks. So whenever the high peaks, you know, they, they are really high enough to stand outside the water level, then they become the islands. So that's what the actual Andaman Island and Nicobar Islands are actually the mountain peaks, which have their own vegetation, like, you know, evergreen forest, deciduous forest, and coastal uh, littoral forest. And things. So it offers a lot of niches for the birds to evolve, to adapt and to diversify. But Lakshadweep, on the contrary, is of completely, you know, coral origin. It's a coral deposit of origin for millions of years. So it doesn't have its own, own vegetation, native vegetation. So obviously it didn't, you know, it does, uh, couldn't provide much of any niches for the land birds to evolve or diversify. But nonetheless, Lakshadweep Island still hold substantial breeding colonies of some of the seabirds like lesser crested tern, greater crested tern, sooty tern, where you don't find anywhere else. So in the sense that, you know, that the largest breeding colonies of the seabirds occur in Lakshadweep Islands, like Bagar Islands and Pitti Islands. So in that sense, Lakshadweep is, you know, extremely important from the bird's diversity 
perspective as well. Yeah. So I will anyway post this uh, detailed answer by this evening. So you can go through it and check. So any other question is that, okay, in one family, different species spread in entirely different location. How is the happened? Convergence are spread before continental movement. Okay, so this is again, uh, you know, the question of scale actually. So we, if you are talking about uh, the, see there are two things. One is the biogeographical dis dispersal, the ecological dispersal. So I suppose you are asking about the biogeographical dispersal. So that, yeah, as you said that it could have probably the birds would have been aided, the movement would have been aided by continental drift. Our birds could also move, you know, they could fly very well. So they could have probably, they could colonize very well. They could fly out and colonize the islands. And, things. and uh, <clears throat> so if you look at uh, the actual biogeography, like how, how did we get, like, for, for example, we have laughing thrushes. So laughing thrushes in the Northeast. And we have laughing thrushes along the Himalayas. In fact, some 30, 34 species of laughing thrushes along the from Western to Eastern Himalaya. And then... Absolutely, they are absent in the Indian mainland, you know, the peninsular India and central India. Again, we get four species of laughing thrushes along the Western Ghats. So how, how, how did this occur? So there are two ways of looking at it. One is that, I mean, I mean, you know, in terms of biogeography, one is that birds disperse. And uh, second is that probably birds were once continuously, you know, present, but then there's some events, you know, some barriers would have evolved much later and that barrier would have stopped the birds to move, you know, to and fro. So we call those barriers as vicarians events. So either it's a dispersal hypothesis or vicarians. So the dispersal is saying is that probably once upon a time, you know, the entire Indian subcontinent was covered with uh, humid forest, humid evergreen forest. So the laughing thrushes, primarily, you know, the inhabitants of the humid evergreen forest and, you know, moist deciduous forest, probably they were, they occurred all through the Indian, all through the central and, you know, all through the mainland India. But the, with the, the you know, we lost the desiccation of the vegetation and desertification, probably now the, we get the humid evergreen forest only in the about 1000 meter altitude in the mountain peaks. That's available only along the Western Ghats, not in between. So probably the in between, because of the desiccation, we call that as desiccation of the natural vegetation, the laughing thrushes probably lost out in between, between the Western Ghats and Eastern Himalaya. So this is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that the laughing thrushes were once found ex extensively over the mainland India, but there are a lot of barriers, like even this desiccation would be one barrier that came up and then they change the habitat or maybe change in the, you know, the paleoclimate and that changed the paleoclimatic conditions uh, of the laughing, you know, the habitats. So the laughing thrushes the, between Western Ghats and Eastern Himalaya would have probably lost out. So there are two ways of looking at it. So I, I guess that uh, answers your question. I think that's what the question also says. Is another thing you said that birds can. Sorry, I couldn't get the full question here. Birds can evolve even within 100 years. Can you please explain more? I was thinking evolution needs thousands of years. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, conventionally, even we tend to think that evolution you know, needs, yeah, for a species to evolve, we need, you know, need thousands and thousands of years. But probably, you know, uh, most of the species it might take actually, but uh, the recent thinking and recent evidences from phylogenetic studies and especially studies from Galapagos Islands, the Darwin's finches and Galapagos Islands have clearly demonstrated that we don't need thousand years. All that it needs is that, you know, the right uh, stochastic, what we call a stochastic event. It could be a trout or it could be a rain, any unpredictable event. So that can trigger, you know, a population crisis or something like that. So if in that particular time, if that one individual or one small subpopulation has the right gene, you know, which make them adapt to that things, they can evolve, you know, it's a diversify into different species. So it's a matter of 
even it could be like you know 100 to 200 years and uh, so as i posted in one you know in answer, uh, somebody is uh, asked this question saying that you know what are the factors that trigger speciation so it's basically chance events so either whether it's a speciation or diversification they all start with chance events so because natural history no, sorry natural selection is nothing but you know it, it's like right time at the right place so the gene the you know the birds or the, the particular individual or the population should have the gene expressed at the right time at the right condition so whenever there's some unpredictable even happen and but so all these things won't happen at the same time quite often right so the probability will be extremely low so that's maybe why you know we don't see you know uh, as many species as otherwise you know you, we would have seen like every year we would have been seeing evol evolution of new more and more species but that 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 won't happen because the probability of all these three things coming together and happening at the same time would be extremely low right and sorry i need to more about the bsc ps okay the biological species concept and phylogenetic species concept i think i have posted an answer yesterday or two days back please check the discussion board so biological species concept is basically for you know we call two populations as single species as long as they interbreed and the phylogenetic species concept doesn't have that condition it says that as long as they are diagnosably distinct as long as we know that they share the same common ancestors we can call them as species and uh, we do approach you know we do adopt a hybrid approach uh, wherever there is like if this two populations are like allopatric like in the presentation i have shown you the orange minivet and scallop minivet the scallop minivet and orange minivet are allopatically distributed like you know one along the western guards and other things they are at minivet and scallop minivet in the eastern and northeastern india so for these cases biological species concept we cannot apply because there is no way that we can see we can demonstrate that they can interbreed because they don't their ranges do not overlap or do not touch so then those cases phylogenetic species concept is the most convenient one to apply right and what are some prominent features i should look at id a bird uh, i'm sorry as sukhail pointed out this course is not for bird identification but uh, in case if you are interested please check uh, bird count india website where you know they regularly carry blog posts by experienced and expert birders on different tax of different groups so like you know for gulls what you should look at for warblers what you should look at and other things so just please check out that website birdcountindia dot you know birdcount yeah bird birdcountindia website and please explain the morphological similarities are often superficial uh, well yeah so uh, this is basically the convergence right so like uh, yeah right thanks to you that's getting started with birding so that that's the thing that you could check out for those things and <clears throat> so convergence is quite common so if you just look at the morphology then in that case you know by looking at the morphology as i explained in the presentation so hummingbirds and sunbirds would be put together in the same family right because they have the long bill and they feed on nectar and they are they have iridescent colors so it's uh, they morphologically they're spectacularly similar but then uh, by anatomically and physiologically they are very distinct in fact they don't even come in the same order you know one is the non passeriforms other is the passeriforms so that's what i said that morphological similarities are often you know quite uh, superficial like falcons and the parakeets you know uh, till we did the phylogenetic analysis molecular phylogeny nobody could suspect that falcons and parrots you know are sister taxa so the hook shaped bill in the falcons basically they probably evolved you know to for the adaptation for a carnivorous life so that that's that's why it's extremely you know important not to go by morphological characters alone in identify in you know in classification or taxonomy they often uh, they they often uh, you know misguide us our judgment
Okay. Any other questions in the chat box? There's a question in the chat, uh, Jaipal, about uh, house crows with hook beaks. Okay. Indrani motor. Yeah. Howrah, West Bengal. Some house crows, house crows with hook beaks are being observed by some observer. Okay. This uh, bill, we call it bill deformities. So the bill deformities in the is quite common in. Uh, particularly the house crow and also even large bill crow and uh, some of the tits and uh, so uh, this is uh, we actually do not know the exact cause of this bill deformity though we have very recent studies from Europe they identified one particular virus so uh, so one particular virus responsible for this bill deformity but we are not very sure whether that's the same virus that's also behind the deformities in India so that's something needs to be explored, studied. Jepa, there's a question a little further up um, by Anirban. Is the theropod or the origin of birds finally settled or is the archosaur question still open? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's still open. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, that that's, you know, that's science, you know. Uh, people are, often have... All you know, uh, contrasting opinions, but then data and then everything. But that that's how science progresses. So there's no single answer for that. Even for that matter, even for taxonomy or classification or what is a species, which is not a species or subspecies. All the things are. Uh, I mean, it's like you know they've just moved. I, I would say that somewhere between hypothesis and the truth. So the actual truth will be like very difficult to see. But then we're we are getting there, you know, inching there. So, thank you, Girish Anantamurti. Sorry, Jaipal, you reading the chat? There are a couple of other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Two subspecies populate. Okay, how much genetic distance should be there between two sequences to be considered different species? Which gene should be targeted for for genetic studies in birds? See, they <coughs> actually I'm not the right person because uh, should probably later uh, Dr. Robin or Dr. Umesh they should be able to tell you about this. But uh, uh, there are one one is mitochondrial gene, other is the nuclear gene. So people go for both mitochondrial and nuclear gene and then combine these things to look at the, the, what they call as concatenation, right? So then they look at uh, the G, particular gene length. And the important thing is that how many you know gene sequence that we use for interpreting. Because if you look at the early, late 90s and early 2000s, early 21st century, the, the, the length of the genes which are used for taxonomic assessment would be very, very low because it is so costly and but now it, uh, you know it is enormous stride in the you know in the techniques and it become more cost effective so people are now going for even long chain analysis and even the whole genome analysis and other things so i guess both mitochondrial and nuclear genes are used but uh, which part of that uh, you know is uh, is it like co2 or co3 those things which probably Dr. Robin would tell you more because each of these things have their own limitations. And so people need to be very cautious interpreting the phylogenetic relationships based on different genes. Do subspecies populations remain isolated from one another or can the same region have different subspecies of species living together? Uh, well, uh, Aisha, the, when we mean, when we say subspecies, it does mean that they are geographically, you know, isolated. They are geographically distinct. So subspecies is basically it's a yes, it is based on diagnosable differences in the morphology. But it also the one other condition is that they should be geographically non-overlapping. So so it, it it follows that if we have a two subspecies, the two subspecies will be of you know occupying different geographical areas. But then uh, subspecies will always have a long over you know in uh, interaction areas, so where the ranges actually overlap quite extensively. Like, for example, if you take the house crow, so we have this subspecies, you know, four or five subspecies of house crow. 
So like Eastern, Western, Northwestern. So they, if you go to the core of these things, they're morphologically, they're quite like, for example, Zagmeri, subspecies Zagmeri in the Northwestern India will have extremely pale in color, almost whitish in color. But if you, you know, if you go to the proticators of, you know, uh, the Northeastern India, quite dark, much darker and more iridescent. So, so these are the variations, but when they meet like in uh, Northwest India and uh, Western India, then we'll find, we'll find some clinal variation, you no know, clinal changes. So, but of course for the wintering species, yes, they winter together. Like we have quite a few wintering species, you know, more than some 13, 14 percentage of species that winter in India, especially most of the waterfowl and also like warblers. And we do have oh, like, you know, you, if you take the greenish warbler, we have both Trochilides and Viridirostris. Both are winter migrants to the southern India and, you know, central and southern India. And both occur together sometimes, especially in the, the northern Sayatris. And we get both Viridirostris and, you know, Trochilides. So that, that happens. But only during the breeding sign, you know, during the breeding season, they will not be geographically, you know, overlapped. They will not occur together. And... Okay, I need one, two, three. Okay, that is done. Sometimes I've observed white pressed kingfish in our house garden, even though no water bodies in the area. Why are they visiting our garden? Huh. Uh, Suresh, actually, white pressed uh, kingfisher or uh, white throated kingfisher is, uh, yeah, they, it's not entirely dependent on water bodies, like unlike the other kingfishers. Other kingfishers are completely dependent on the wetland, but uh, white throated kingfisher. Okay, you know, it, it, its main food is, you know, com main food comprises not just fishes, but also insects and arthropods and other small invertebrates and even sometimes even small vertebrates too, like reptiles and lizards. So they can, they're, they're very adaptive. So that, that's why, you know, they, you can always find even white throated kingfisher even in the middle of the cities. Due to global warming and change in ecology system, birds are get affected. So, can we expect evolution birds due to man-made disaster to survive? Uh, well, so that's I'm not very sure, but uh, yeah, some you know uh, it, it it can happen. Like uh, we don't know. I mean, as I said, that it's all chance events. So, if there is a man-made disaster and then the particular population of the one species you know, could have the advantage over other populations if they can diversify, it can happen. But then that likelihood is extremely low. That's what I mean. So subspecies, morpho variants, ecotypes. Uh, so please check the, uh, I think it's by Rahul, Dr. Rahul. Yeah, please check, check the dashboards discussion forum. I think a couple of days back, someone has asked the same question and we have put the answer to this. Why is that domestic ducks show a great variation in coloration while mallard species from which they are domesticated do not? Is it because Anna's platform could develop mutation genes that allow this that mallards lack? <coughs> okay, develop mutations in actually the domestic ducks is actually they were bred for you know they were selected for the domestic varieties. They are selected through thousands and thousands of generations by humans. So they were selected for you know their probably for the body mass, for the meat, or they're selected for the egg, or you know, or they, they may even be selected for the ornamental purpose. So this selection is not natural selection, it is for the artificial selection. So that, that's why we find huge variations in domestic breeds, either whether it's a ducks or in pigeons. But in the wild, it's not so obvious, it's not so. So the, in the wild, you know, it's like natural selection. And, uh, you know, if some individuals, it's not that wild, you know, they, they don't have any variations. They do, of course, you know, there are a lot of variations in the plumage in the wild. But what happens is that when yeah, the variations, really when the variations turn to be, you know, lethal, then the populations are that individuals that disappear. So there's no way that particular gene will be perpetuated through the generations. So that's how the natural selection acts, right? Thank you. Racket tail rongo comes in at this time every year and it appears to be adult, but it's without rackets. It's an odd occurrence of species evolving. So uh, I suspect uh, this could be molting. Uh, they evolve 
So set a racket tail rongo without the tail streamers. I without the rackets. That I think it's quite common. I think at this time of the year they probably have the post winter moult. So it's quite common. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jaipal. Uh, so, did I miss out any question? No, I don't. I don't think so, uh, Jaipal. Uh, I wanted to just. I think we have one hour and we're over. But um, I forgot earlier. I wanted to request uh, Devika, course uh, coordinator, as well as the teaching assistants, to maybe, um, if they can, switch on the videos and just introduce themselves briefly. Uh, you know, where do you where do you work and what do you do? Uh, can we can we have anybody who's ready uh, between Jobin? Uh, Chiti, Sonia, Devika, could you do that? Sonia, you're on, you're muted. You're on mute, Sonia. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia. Uh, I'm currently uh, pursuing my PhD in Aisha Mohali. Uh, and yeah, I'm like uh, participating as a CA for this course. And uh, I have uh, worked for my PhD on words, uh, uh, social words, words and development. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Sorry, I should have prepared you. I was sort of dropping this on you guys uh, suddenly. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks, Sonia. Thank uh -huh. you. Just, uh, I thought it would be nice for everybody to see uh, who uh, the wonderful teaching assistants and all are. Uh, and not only these older, old people, you know, twittering on like, uh, me at least. <laughs> uh, Jobin, are you ready? Yeah, hi. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. I am Jobin, Jobin Varges from uh, uh, ISA Tirupati. Uh, I work with uh, Dr. Vivi Robin, who's also a, a faculty in this course. And uh, yeah, I work on uh, invasive landscapes and uh, native biodiversity that comes uh, in them. So yeah, thank you. Thanks. And, and Jobin works on, on birds, right? I mean, uh, uh, yes, yes, primarily birds. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Joel. Devika? Hi, hi, everyone. I am Devika. And um, yeah, I'm the coordinator of this course. Uh, I have a PhD from ISC Bangalore from Center for Ecological Sciences. I've done my PhD in behavioral ecology. And right now I'm working with NCF as a project manager. I work with Suhail, actually. So yeah. Any doubts, any questions about the course, just let them come in and we'll be there to answer. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of wonderful support. I mean, there's the faculty, but then all these other wonderful people. I think Chiti is not here right now. That's Is that right, uh, Chiti is traveling, actually. She's on field. She's traveling. Okay, maybe she can introduce us at one of the next uh, live sessions. But she will also have live sessions. So Chiti and Ro uh, Jobin will have... Uh, dedicated live sessions with you uh, every week. Uh, so you will get very used to seeing their uh, their faces as well. Um, so I don't know, what do you guys think? We still we have a couple more questions uh, for uh, Jaipal. Uh, uh, or, yeah. This or uh, do we have a hard deadline after an hour? What is the... What's I, the... I just quickly say and just quickly sure, Jaipal, please, try please. to... Yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah. Daniel asked uh, about the reverse evolution. Uh, Actually, yeah, the, especially, you know, you're talking about the pre-born bird that showed a neoknath mandible. So the reversal, evolutionary reversal, of course, you know, the Dolo's law, you know, for the last uh, majority of, you know, the large part of the 20th century biologists strongly believed in Dolo's law that uh, so-called, you know, the irreversible irreversibility of the uh, traits. So, but of course, now the Dolo's law has been demonstrated to be wrong. And so it's quite possible that the mandible evolved, you know, after the KT boundary, it's quite possible that the, the basal clade would have probably got this paleognath mandible uh, reversal. It's quite possible, but I'm not very, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very sure uh, what exactly uh, you asked this question about, but uh, it's quite possible, yeah. And I'm sure do birds leave habit evolved to be more cunning and able to understand human behavior? Please explain with examples of creek locking thrush and babblers. Uh, okay, so uh, well, so the birds that are adapted to living in human modified ecosystems, like what we call as synanthropic birds, like common mina, house crow. So of course, yes, they are quite adapted to live with humans, and they probably you know, uh, 
they 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 are successful in human modified landscape mainly because they could adapt to it and so i don't know whether to call that as cunning or whether to call that as you know as intelligent but uh, yes they are very you know uh, they are very adaptive but uh, i'm not very sure about the street laughing thrush or babblers and uh, so maybe i, I do not understand but uh, yes for babblers like todarius babblers uh, like you know the, the northern india and uh, also northern uh, indian subcontinent it be like Uh, jungle babbler and southern billy yellow bill babbler and both occur very closely with humans because and they kind of you know they get adapted to that and they probably uh are new use the resources that have been offered you know the, by food resources being offered to the human common as a, like almost like a human common so which deep love interest i'm not very sure maybe in the himalayas quite possible thank you uh there are no other questions yeah that's great so then we'll draw this to uh, close and can somebody say devika when is the next uh, live session happening uh, for everybody to join and anyway, we you'll get an update of course you'll get a a uh, an email and various reminders i don't know if people have been getting text messages at least those who are in india i got an sms reminder uh, i i think all of you would as well uh so uh, good most probably i mean uh, second pep uh, first step sorry by the is the next uh, next uh, live session that's a guest uh, session is that right <clears throat> yeah okay thank you everybody thank you for joining and uh, see you uh, all through the course yeah bye have a good evening yeah. thank you sunil thanks sonia and jobi devika